27 in the blue songbook. Number 27. Number 27. I stand and sing, I sing the mighty power of God. Number 27. service today, Lord. Uh, whatever happens here would be glorifying to you. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to hear from you today. Lord, I ask you help us to have our hearts in tune to listen to what you'd like to speak to us, uh, whether it be encouragement or whether it be uh, edifying and building up or whether it be tearing down some extra rough edges, Lord, whatever whatever it is, Lord, I ask that we'd be willing to hear from, from you today and to address those things. Lord, I ask you to bless the service and the singing and everything done here. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How about number 357? 357. Got special music this morning in a minute. And, uh, quite a few announcements today, but uh, looking forward to a meeting coming up. I'll just give one announcement before we get started. Adrian Dominguez, if you haven't heard yet, Brother Adrian Dominguez uh, is going to be here from Aurora, Colorado. Uh, Lord willing, on January 29th, 30th, and 31st. So if you can just remember the last three days of January, we're going to have a special meeting with Adrian Dominguez. And so I ask that you would please keep that in prayer. And uh, we're looking forward, to, looking forward to that. All right, number 357. Here, my God, to the Thank you. 
drop the piano out after the first note. On the fourth verse. Then with my waking thoughts, bright with thy praise, out of my stony griefs, Bethel I raise. So Take a special offering. Somebody, you two want to do offering? You find some baskets. I think there's some over there. Uh, take an offering about oh, by quarterly or something like that. Um, just want to take up a love offering for our accountant. Uh, we don't have a um, people on the payroll here, but uh, we'd like to take up a love offering. You don't have to give. If this is your first time here, please, it's not. You're not obligated to give. Uh, but Olivia did put quite a bit of time into getting our numbers all caught up so uh we'll pray here just a second uh in sec. so olivia put quite a bit of time into getting our numbers uh books caught up and so um <clears throat> we i think we're missing what like 50 bucks 55 55 we got down to 55 dollars is the difference so, on the 
fourth quarter and then the annual. <laughs> we'll find it. <laughs> That's about ten times closer than I can get it. So, <laughs> so uh, spent quite a bit of time working on that. Anyways, uh, if you could give toward that, uh, let's pray to take up an offering. Lord, I ask you bless this now. Uh, thank you for Olivia putting the time into it. And Lord, I ask that it be uh, help and encouragement to her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I was asked to be louder. <laughs> I'm going to tone it down just a little bit. And I was asked to be more enthusiastic. So, <laughs> mm, one out of two ain't bad. Um, reiterating, uh, we have Mr. Dominguez coming uh, two weeks uh, on the 29th through the 31st. And uh, we're going to be having a potluck. Um, on that 31st, uh, let's see, question and answer cards. We've got three by five cards up here. If you have a question for the pastor, he go ahead and write that up. If you want, uh, you can put your name on the bottom or not. And then he'll uh, address those questions in the afternoon study. We have a business meeting after today, this afternoon's service uh, today, uh, we're going to be discussing business. Okay, <laughs> Wednesday night, uh, we have Bible study, and we show up at about 5.30 for, a, uh, uh, for dinner, and then the study starts at about 6 o'clock. I'd like to thank everybody who did the new move um, letters. We should have another set of lists coming next Sunday. So think about, about doing that. We're going to see if we can get on it a little bit faster this month and uh, get those out. The new movers, uh, everybody that's, been, that's moved from out of Billings into Billings, we're sending them a note inviting them to come to church and giving them some information on, uh, on the services. Uh, there are many Facebook videos on YouTube of the, uh, of the sermons. So look for those. What, what do they look? You can look up Bible Baptist Billings on YouTube. Bible Baptist Billings, and uh, you can look them up there. Um, there's a new prayer letter. There are new prayer letters uh, over on the table. Um, and the last thing is we're going to have some special music.
Sounded like a choir singing up here. <laughs> How many would you like to hear that again, maybe for the special meeting? All right. If you would like to do a special, or if you have a special in mind, please coordinate all that with Abby. We'll try to have one or two Sunday morning, have one or two in the afternoon service, and hopefully have one each night, uh, so Friday and Saturday, if we can do that. All right, let's get Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. make that Genesis 29. We've got two verses confused. It says they're all similar to the same thing. Genesis 20, 29. We're going over the book of Genesis, and I sound awfully loud in here, Joey. We're going over the book of Genesis coming through uh, the life of Abraham, then the life of Isaac a little bit. We talked about him. Spent a good deal amount of time with Esau last week, and uh, Esau, kind of the worldly man, the worldly Christian, spends all his time and his energy and his thinking and his thought process on the temporal things down here. And his life is typified by one, bot one, one uh, bowl of stew. And then uh, this week we're going to look at the life of Esau, Does anybody, uh, or the life of, of Jacob. Does anybody remember what Esau's name means? It means Harry. And then his other name is Edom. Anybody remember what Edom means? Red. 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 So he was a red-haired, really hairy guy. Uh, he's an outdoors guy, and he's so hairy they named him that when he was born. And that was pretty common back then. Uh, and then when Jacob was born, uh, he's got a hold of Esau's heel right from the womb, which must have been quite a sight for the midwife. I mean, it's hard to phase them, but she probably hadn't seen that before. And so they got to talking about it, and they decided, boy, he's got him by the heel. We're going to name him Deceiver or Supplanter. And then Esau later says, is not he rightly named? Talking about his brother. Doesn't he have the right name? He's a deceiver because he stole my blessing. So I want to look at the life of Jacob here. And I gave my sermon title to the, uh, the sound pastor back there. I gave my sermon title and Anna overheard the title. This title of the message is, What Happens When You Go Your Own Way? What Happens When You Go Your Own Way? And she said, oh good, is this a rerun? Is this the one you preached before? So the secret's out, yes. <laughs> This is a rerun. This is on the life of Jacob. And uh, this message, uh, the Lord gave this message to me a number of years ago, about five years ago now. Um, and it came at a point in my life where I think, just best I can figure, me doing some things in my life that I don't think the Lord wanted me to do, not trying to just dive off into the deep pits of sin or anything like that, but just... Me taking a, making a decision without a proper amount of prayer and without me saying, Lord, I'm willing to do either. I just uh, said, Lord, this is what I want to do. Would you please help me go this direction? And I never sat and said, Lord, is this what you want me to do? And so the Lord is gracious and he let me go that way. And then uh, have you ever noticed when you're hiking or backpacking or taking a walk in the woods, if you jump off the trail and you go berry picking, right, and then you go finding more berries and like, oh, there's better ones over there. And you start picking over here and then you're like, oh, I see some over there. And by the time you, by the time it's been half an hour, you can't even see the trail anymore. And guess how long it takes to get back to the trail? At, at a minimum, <laughs> the same amount of time it took you to leave the trail. And so the title of this message is what happens when you go your own way. And the Lord gave me this message. I think it was about the exact amount of time that it took me to get back on the way that he wanted me the whole time. And I've given that illustration before. I'm not going to give it today. All right, look at Genesis chapter 29. Let's look at Jacob's illustration. Genesis 29 in verse 1. It says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. Jacob went on his journey. When we learned that passage in Bible school, our preacher said, uh, he said, those are some very ominous words when Jacob went on his journey. And that's a dangerous thing for you to say, I've got my sights fixed on this thing. Lord, please bless it. Off I go. Without the consideration of what God thinks and the consideration of other people's advice and counsel and all those things. Then Jacob went on his journey. 
Now, now the review here in chapter 28, if you want to back up to chapter 28, I'll read a couple of verses here starting in verse 10. Jacob is left home. Esau is threatened to kill him. And Jacob's advice from his mother is to, to leave home, run away to his family. In verse 10, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Very famous passage, that's Jacob's ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father and the God of Isaac, the land where thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And I knew it not. Could you ever be in a place where the Lord was and you not know the Lord's there? Have you ever been in a really magnificent church building? Hand carved pews, ornate trim work everywhere you look. I mean, just arched rafters and you're like, to make that curvy beam like that, they would have to take a beam this big to get all that cut out of that. That's a lot of expense and a lot of time and a lot of craftsmanship that we know nothing about in our day. Very rare to see that. And you would say, in a place as spectacular as that, you come in there and it's quiet and the ambience is just so, you'd say, surely, surely God's got to be in this place. And if you've ever been in one of those places, I don't know if you have or not, I don't know that I've ever found God in a place like that. I mean, it was nice and it was quiet and it was big and it had just the right echo and it had just the right tone of the, the guy standing on the split chancel on one side and the, and the communion table on the other side and it was just so. And there was no God there. There was no spirit of God speaking to anybody. It was just dead as, as the wood that was making up the building. And then you come in a little crummy place sometimes. I've been in these little crummy churches where it's just a storefront building. And you get there and there's some, some folding chairs set up. And they got that linoleum floor. It looks about like that stuff back there. And you got just, you know, 20 or 30 chairs set up and, and, you know, 10 or 15 people show up and the preacher gets to preaching and the kids, you know, get to being distracting and then somebody has to improvise, you know, and it's just this, this little hole in the wall of a place and about two thirds into the message, that preacher is speaking right to your heart. <laughs> and you say, man, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have expected it just looking around this crummy little place, this little place that the world would just uh, turn its nose up at. But then the Lord shows up in those places. And what a shame it would be to show up in a place where the Lord was and His presence was and His Spirit was working and dealing with people and you to know it not. But thank God Jacob figured it out. Verse 17, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? When you see God face to face, you, there's some terror involved. There's none, this is none other but the house of God. There's no building there. This is where God dwells. It's His house. And this is the gate of heaven. Here's an access to heaven. That's why angels are moving about here. And I didn't even know it. I just fell asleep here. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stones that he put for his pillows and set, them, set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon it on the top of it. And he said, this is a place I want to remember. I'm going to name this place Bethel. Beth meaning house. El, Elohim meaning God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace then. See the if in verse 20 and the then in verse 21. God tells Jacob an unconditional promise in his sleep and Jacob says, God, I got a promise for you. If you bless me, if you keep me, if you take care of me, if you bring me back to mommy, I mean back to my family, if you do these things for me, then you'll be my God. There's something off there, if you can't catch it. There's something off a little bit in Jacob's promise here. And the Lord's going to bless him. And the Lord's going to keep him. And Jacob's a good guy in Scripture.
But Jacob spends some time here. Verse 22, This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me will I surely give the tenth unto thee. Then Jacob went on his journey. Jacob kind of has his mind made up where he's going to take a direction here with or without God, and he says, God, you'll be my God if you take care of me. And God calls these things to your attention in the scriptures. I mean, it's just in passing. You could read through this and say, wow, Jacob prayed, and it's a good thing that Jacob prayed. But then the Holy Spirit tells you in the scripture, Jacob went on his journey. And so I want to preach this morning, what happens when you go your own way? Lord, I ask that you would please bless the words here this morning. Lord, I ask you to help us to, to look at Jacob's life, not be hypercritical, but look at the good and the bad and the things that he does and the mistakes he makes. And Lord, I ask you to help us to look at our own life, look at the mistakes and the decisions we've made, and to just be honest about it and to just take it to you and to be uh, willing, like I said, Lord, to be willing to go either way. And Lord, we've all been down this track, some of us further than others. Uh, but Lord, I ask you to help us to, to learn some things from Jacob's life and have a good outcome like Jacob did. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if these points get discouraging, I promise you the last one is hopeful. All right. So this is just a warning. And if you haven't done this, uh, especially you young people, uh, maybe if you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 in there somewhere, and you've made the, you know, man, I really blew 50 bucks. Thank God. Come forward to the altar this morning. Thank God I only lost $50 on that stupid thing that I did doing things my way. Because when you get older, the dollar amounts go up. I'll give you those <laughs> illustrations in a minute. Um, but if, you, uh, if you're older in the Lord and you have gone your own way, take hope and take courage. Because Jacob was uh, pretty old here in his day. He's in his 40s here. And he's about to, uh, he's, I think he dies at 147. And he makes these mistakes and he decides to go his own way. And it's very, very costly but you can recover from it. What happens when you go your own way? Number one, if you're taking notes, you do things your way. You do things your way. Look at verse 7. Jacob goes out there and he sees Rachel over there and, and uh, he, says, he says, man, that girl's pretty attractive there and she's got some sheep. I know a thing or two about sheep. I'm going to go. I'm going to go strike up a conversation with this girl. Verse 6. And he said unto them, Is he well? And he, they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter... Cometh with the sheep. Rachel, the word Rachel means sheep. Verse 7, And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then, then we water the sheep. Jacob comes up on this scene, sees a bunch of sheep, says, Hey, I know how to get sheep watered. This is what we do when we water sheep. We push the stone off of the well's mouth and we water the sheep. And Rachel says, well, I don't know who you are, but that's not how we do it in this country. In this country, we kind of hang out and wait until the other shepherds come along. They roll the stone away. They've been a help to us. We've been a help to them. We have this agreement worked out. And then when they roll the stone away, they get their water and then we get our water. And Jacob says, what do we, need? we don't need to do all that. I'm a man. I can take care of myself. I know how to get things done. Let me just push this stone out of the way. And he gets down like this and he uses that real strong part of his body right there. And he says, I can push this stone over, off of this well. And he looks like to me, he's trying to impress the girls. That's what it looks like to me. I know how you should do this. And Rachel says, well, there's a reason we don't do it this way. And Jacob says, I know how to make things happen. What happens when you go your own way? You do things in your own strength. You do things with a, an impressive show. You say, well, I don't know if I read all that in the text. I know. Maybe you see it differently in the text. I have a habit of seeing things differently than everybody else. <laughs> but what I see is that this sets the theme for how Jacob handles everything else in his life. Everything else in Jacob's life, he says, I don't need to pray. I don't need an altar. I don't have to stop and talk to God. I just get things done. Watch out for the construction companies that say, get her done construction. You don't want that guy messing with your countertops. Trust me. He doesn't seek God's will. He doesn't pray for wisdom. Later on, you know the story. He's going to marry this girl, Rachel, but he never prays about the, the wife. He never prays about the situation. He never prays about his career decision. I know people in this country, and they say, Christians, different churches I've been to, I give you their names. Hey, we're going to move across country. Oh, where are you going? Oh, we're going to this such such place. We've always wanted to live there. We've had our mind on it for quite a while. Oh, good, good. That's good. What, what are you moving for? Oh, we got a job there. Got a good job opportunity. Got there's some good work there. We 
maybe they know some family or something. I say, hey, do you got a good church that you're going to there? Oh, I'm sure we'll find one when we get there. You might not. You might not find one when you get there. You say, Isaac, there's so many Baptist churches in this town. How come you had to start a church? Well, <laughs> if you knew how many times I had prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, just let me go to somebody else's church. You wouldn't have to support me. If I had a dollar for every time, you wouldn't have to put any money in the offering. You know what people do? They make these decisions in life, life-changing, earth-shattering decisions, and they never ask God's advice on the thing. What happens when you go your own way? You don't pray about your own career decisions. Jacob's the kind of guy, I know they don't have churches back then, so to speak, but Jacob's the kind of guy, he probably picks the church of his choice. How many of you ever heard that saying? you got to pick the, go to the church of your choice. How many of you ever heard that? That is the worst thing you could ever do. That's like saying, read the Bible of your choice. Who's giving this advice? Do you consider God's attitude in anything you do? I mean, shop at the supermarket of your choice, sure. But we're talking about spiritual things, right? Do you think that God might have a Bible that He wants you to read and have another Bible He doesn't want you to read? Why don't you read the Bible of God's choice? You say, I don't know what that is. Don't ask me what it is. You figure out what it is. You, know, you all know what Bible I preach from here. That's your choice. You can bring any Bible you want here. You're not going to get critiqued and rebuked. I might jab you a little bit sometimes. But I don't, I don't, I really don't care. I really don't care. I want you to read the Bible of God's choice. And I want you to go to the church of God's choice. I have people call me sometimes. It's becoming more frequent. They call me up and they say, Hey, are you the pastor about, yep, this is Isaac, I'm the pastor. What do you believe about X? And I say, okay, uh, I believe this and this and this. And here's a scripture verse, or here's just a simple answer. Oh, good, yeah, I, I was, I've been looking at that, and I think that's right. Okay, what do you believe about this? And I say, well, yeah, I, I believe about that too. I think we're in agreement on this. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? We get down seven questions on the phone call. I'm trying, I got a pan of mud in my hand. I got mud all over the place. I'm <laughs> looking, my neck needs a break anyway. So um, we get this question number seven. We are still in agreement on everything he asked. Are you just asking questions until you find something that you disagree with because the Lord's pushing you a direction and you're nervous about making a new decision? I understand that psychologically. It's, it's hard to make a new decision. But you're just going to go down the list till you find something wrong. What does God want you to do? It doesn't matter if you agree with me on every 16 things that you have as a list of priority fundamentals or whatever you want to call them. That doesn't matter. What does God say? That's what matters. Isaac Drake will be wrong from behind this pulpit frequently. Bar mark it down. It's okay. So will you. <laughs> Somebody said something to me this week, and I appreciate their coming to me and telling me, hey, we appreciate this, this, and this. You said this. I don't know if I agree with that. I appreciate you didn't say that. And I said, I will consider it. And I've considered it all week. Can you do that? Can you be grown up and mature enough in the Lord to say, hey, this thing you said last week, I, didn't, I don't know if I agree, I don't see it your way. Uh, could you just ho hold off on that a little bit or explain it better or prepare better when you go to... Can you, that's maturity. We didn't agree with him on one thing, so we're ready to leave and find another church. That's because you do things your way. Yeah. That's how you picked the church to begin with, and that's why you'll pick another one when you leave. You do things your way. Find out what God wants you to do. Boy, we're never going to get through this message, are we? Number two. <laughs> number two. What happens when you go your own way? You determine your own pay. You determine your own pay. I found this poem here, and it, uh, it, it just says something that runs completely opposite to the way I was taught and raised and think. And I'm not even sure if it's true, but I think it's true, so I'm going to say it. Um, it says that you determine what you make. That's what it says. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening, and when I counted my scanty store. So this guy's poor, and he says, I, I, I bargained, and I got a penny out of it. For life is just an employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. Well, that's true. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismay that any wage I had asked of life, any wage I had asked of life, life would have paid. 
You ever a guy you see an ad on on Facebook and you're looking for somebody to do work for you or on Craigslist or whatever, and he he says, "I can do any kind of work." And you're like red flag number one. Nobody's good at everything. Okay, willing to work for twenty to twenty five dollars an hour. And you're like, wait a minute. You're gonna show up with tools on my job site and you made eighteen dollars an hour at the last job and you think twenty five is a lot? Twenty five dollars an hour doesn't cover you driving across town and showing up. Some of you don't realize that. If you've ever made twenty dollars an hour working for an employer, they were getting they were paying for you to be there thirty plus dollars an hour. Do you understand that? Anybody understand that? Some of you understand that. This is the secrets of the business world. <laughs> Do you know that if you have a retirement fund, they're putting so much per hour that you never see, but the company has costed that much money, right? Yeah. And you go to work on your own, and you're like, oh, I think I could charge 20, but I really need 25. No, you need a lot more than that. You need a lot, lot more than that. You know what happens when you go your own way? When you go your own way and you say, I don't need the Lord's advice, you determine your own pay. Look at 29.15. 29.15. Usually when people determine their own pay, they way undervalue themselves or they way overvalue themselves. And Jacob does the former. You determine your own pay. Look at verse 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, this is Rachel's father here. He's going to work for the father-in-law. Because thou art my brother, Jacob met his match here. Shouldest thou serve me for naught? Are you going to serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And he does. Look at verse 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Jacob says, I'll tell you what I'm worth. I know what I'm worth. This is what I'm worth right here. I did that once in my life, and I'll never do that again. I had a guy tell me this is a job they hired me for. They said, uh, Isaac, you're better than the hands that I have working for me. I just worked for him for two days. He said, I would hire you right now. I said, I can't, I can't work for you permanent. But I said, I said, you pay me whatever you're worth. He said, I'll give you, this is a number of years ago, he said, I'll give you 20 bucks for an hour for working for me a day. And I said, oh, wow, 20 bucks, I appreciate it, that's great. And uh, so he was happy, I was happy, we went our separate ways. And then a couple months went by, maybe a year, and somewhere else I'm working. And they say, what are you worth? And I say, I'm worth 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I got fired in three days. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm worth. No, you're not. No, you're not. Not on that job site you weren't. You have a value. Everybody in this room has a value. And that value is not determined by you. God determines your value. Remember the laborers and the penny and they say, I'll give you what's right. Whatsoever is right. You know what I'm worth? Do you know what you're worth? You're worth whatsoever is right. Is God a righteous employer? Boy, if you ever get upset at God about how he treats you, I'll tell you what I do. This is, uh, you get down for two minutes in prayer and say, God, I don't think this is right. I don't think this is fair. I don't think you're treating me right. And you just let the thoughts trickle in that God puts in your mind about how he's taking care of you here and how this situation isn't over with and how this deal over here is still in progress and how he did take care of you here and how you dropped the ball over there. That's how the Lord talks to me. I don't know how he talks to you. Because whatsoever is right, that shall you, you shall receive. And that's what you need to submit to. That's what you need to submit to. If you want to see one of the most funny passages in the entire Bible, look down at verse 21. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast, and it came to pass in that evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her unto him. And he went unto her, and Jake Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah has made for a handmaid, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> and he said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. What happens when you go your own way? Well, you don't say. Well, you don't say. <laughs> oh, boy. I've heard this preached so many times. I don't really know if I need to develop it, but I just love to. <laughs> they have the wedding. They have the feast. Him and Rachel say their vows at the front of the thing with the goofy priest or whatever they do in those days. And then Laban, at the last minute, just switches them up and Jacob discerned it not. What happens? What happens is that eventually in your life, you've got to pay for your past sins. 
And what a fitting way to catch up. Do you remember what Jacob did when he deceived his brother Esau? He deceived his father and took the blessing. Didn't it say back there that it was evening? It was evening when he came in and Isaac's eyes were dim. Look at verse 23. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her unto him. He couldn't see. He took advantage of Isaac's poor eyesight and God gave him some poor eyesight in the evening. Didn't it say that Isaac was brought some savory meat? Verse 22, Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Didn't it say Isaac discerned him not back there in chapter 27? Look at verse 23. It came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and took her, brought her unto him and went unto her. He didn't see who she was. And didn't you hear one of those words back in that past chapter there where Isaac said, uh, Who are you? Who are you? And Jacob said, I am Esau, thy firstborn. And Laban says, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. 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 You ever sit in a church service and that just echoes in your head something the preacher said? My wife and I drove to a meeting one time and on the way to the meeting we said, man, everything is just so in our life. Everything, where is my wife? I need to, hopefully she can hear some of this. We were talking about how everything, like we had a good church. Uh, we hadn't started church yet. We were in a good church. We had, our bills were caught up. We had good work. We were taking a vacation. Everything was just so. And we were discussing on the way to this meeting, we had a long drive to get there. And we said, you know, it almost seems like the calm before the storm. And I thought, you know, maybe it is. We should probably be kind of braced, you know, ready for what's around the corner. Then in the meeting, this is a three or four day meeting. One of the preachers, I could give you his name. He's standing up there preaching. I don't remember what he preached about. And in the middle of his sermon, he said, it's almost like the calm before the storm. The storm, the storm. And my wife and I looked at each other like, oh no, what's coming around the corner? And there was a storm a coming for sure. It was a stormy storm. You know what God does for you? God takes everything in your past that you did wrong and He will make that thing right. It's called reaping and sowing. And you can pray for crop failure and pray that the corn doesn't grow that well that got planted by you and that the weeds don't spring up and that you can keep them under control. There's all kinds of things you could be praying about and be aware of, but you will reap what you sow. And you'll pay for what you do wrong in this life. But remember, God's going to pay you in this life or in the next life for everything that you do right in this life. Reaping and sowing is a good thing and a bad thing. Every farmer has to put corn in the field to get corn. Every farmer tries to keep weeds out so he doesn't get weeds, but whatever he puts in the ground is what he gets. When you go your own way, number four, you have to do things the hard way. You'll have to do things the hard way. Skip ahead to chapter 31. Chapter 31. Kind of skipping the family life here of, of Jacob. Look at chapter 31 and verse 38. Jacob gets to the end of his time here with Laban. Things are wearing thin in their relationship. And he's pretty frustrated with it. And he's complaining to Laban in verse 38. He says, This twenty years have I been with thee. The ewes, thy ewes, and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. I didn't take anything from you. That which was torn of beast I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Jacob's really painting himself to be a pretty good guy here. Verse 40, Thus I was, and the day of the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. That's what happens when you determine your own pay. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. God hath seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. Twenty years. Twenty years of time stuck working for Laban. In that whole passage of time, in the previous chapters, you don't read of one place where Jacob prayed. You don't read of one place where he set up an altar. You don't read of one place where he asked direction from God. I would say that's twenty years of lost time spiritually. His family was growing. He's got a relationship with the children. They're getting older in years. They're watching how mommy and daddy handle things. They're developing their own patterns in their life. 
and Jacob is a man, and Jacob says, I'll do things the hard way. I've heard a man say to me, that's not the first time I lost $20,000 on an investment. That's the hard way. I know it happens, and maybe 20000 isn't much if you got $20 million. I don't know what the, th what the whole story was. But I've heard people on the job say, in justifying themselves and trying to paint themselves in a, in a good light, I was so drunk, I pulled the e-brake on the highway and slammed the back end of my car into a power pole. That was him bragging to me about that. I could give you his name. Okay, Jacob, keep doing things the hard way, I guess. That guy got fired again. Did you hear that guy got fired again? Again? Well, yeah, it was like his third time. <laughs> oh, the boss always hires him back. <sighs> That's a hard way to live. There's drugs involved in at least three of these stories here. What's the story of that guy on your crew? Somebody came up to me one day. What's the story of that guy on your crew? Don't you know him? Don't you guys go to church together? Oh, yeah, we do. This is years and years ago. Well, he told us he was a carpenter, so they set him up at a carpenter's wage. And he wasn't, so they had to make him a laborer. And then at the laborer's wage, he wasn't really happy with the pay, and the whole crew wasn't happy with him, so he eventually quit. What a testimony. Don't tell people you're a $35 an hour carpenter if you're not. <laughs> what happens when you go your own way? You do things the hard way. Change his wages 10 times. Never happy with the pay. I was making $250,000 a year in the oil fields. Has anybody been alive long enough to see the cycle of the oil fields? Maybe you should skim that 250 and average it down to 90. <laughs> and just set your wages there for what you're actually worth. That's just my advice. Somebody put this on their job application. Please don't misconstrue my previous 14 jobs as job hopping. I have never quit a job. <laughs> you know what happened in the midst of all this? Look at verse 42. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, Surely thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. Laban got a rebuke from the Lord because of Jacob's blessing. God promised him a blessing and God continued the blessing and fulfilled the blessing in spite of Jacob's uh, faults and failings. But never mistake God's blessings along your own way as evidence of a yielded life today. God will have his hand of blessing on you because you're saved. God puts his hand of blessing on you because he loves you. God puts his hand of blessing on you because you're his child and he cares and he's gracious and he's long-suffering. And he said, here's the promises I gave to you. And then sometimes Christians say, well, look, everything's going around me. Everything's going good. I don't have to put any time into God's ways and God's work and I don't have to care what God thinks. And God's going to continue blessing you whether you go your own way or not. But don't you think God would appreciate some love and some reciprocal, uh, you having some appreciation for Him instead of going your own way? Number five, eventually you'll be forced to pray. Look at chapter 32. Chapter 32. Esau's coming. Jacob's scared. He hasn't seen him in years. And look in verse 11. He gets down on his knees and says, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. You know what Jacob gets to the point in his life? One of those preachers down in Texas used to say, he'd say, well, it just looks like it's getting bad enough to pray. <laughs> when it's bad enough to pray, that's a good reminder that you need to be thinking about God's words. Look at verse 12. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good. God, you told me. God, you said, I'm going to do you good and make your seed as a sand of it which cannot be numbered from... Whoa, Jacob, what's going on? You got the dusty Bible out, huh? You dusted off the Bible and you remembered what God's words were and you found the promises. What, took, what did it take to get you there? Esau's coming. I'm going to die. <laughs> Eventually, you'll be forced to pray. 
you remember your own vows. Look at verse 9. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of father Isaac, Lord, thou saidest unto me, Return unto thine own country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. God, I made some promises to you back then. You remember God's vows, you remember your own vows, and you remember your own sin. Verse 9. Again, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred. Where is Jacob right now? Verse 3 tells you he's in Edom. That's not his land. That's not his country. You know, it's a good place to be. When you just get backed up against the wall and you're between a rock and a hard place and however it shakes out in your life, it's a good place to be when you have nowhere to go but to your knees and you say, God, what am I supposed to do now? And God says, the same things you've been supposed to be doing for the last so many months. And you say, oh yeah, I knew about that. And the Lord puts his arm around you and says, come on, son, get up. A just man falleth how many times? Over and over and over. <laughs> Seven times. And what? Riseth up again. And the Lord says, you know what? I didn't demand perfection from my children. I just demanded some repentance. Just a little bit of humility. You know what? Jacob ends up uncertain and afraid. In verse 7, he says, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels and the two bands. And he said, If, if Esau come and the other company, he goes right back to his natural thinking. If I do this, this will happen. Look at verse 20, middle of the verse. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure, he will accept of me. And where does it leave him? Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Jacob was left alone. He said, I feel so alone. I have nobody that can help me. Nobody understands. Nobody knows what I'm going through. And that might be the very place that God wants you. You know what men naturally want? Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you want other people's company. I had a roommate who was an extrovert, and he said, you know, he said, I don't like, you know, being by myself, but when I'm around a lot of other people, it just really, you know, charges me up. And I said, you know, I, I don't like being, you know, around a bunch of other people. <laughs> and when I'm alone, I, I just recharge when I'm alone. You know, both of us enjoyed the fellowship of other people. You know, both of us introvert, extrovert, both of us enjoyed some alone time from time to time. It doesn't seem to matter whether what your personality is. At some point, you want the comfort of other people. Some people really feel comfortable in a crowd. Some people really feel comfortable in a large church setting where they can blend in, don't have to intermingle too much, they can leave on their own, and that's comforting. Some people like to be just surrounded with a little bit of noise all the time. How many houses have I gone in and I'm working the job and the TV's on and nobody's watching the TV, nobody's listening to the radio, they just need that background static noise to distract them. Men want some company. And God wants you to get away from the crowd. And God wants you to go outside the camp like His Son Jesus Christ did. God wants you to spend some quiet time and He brings Jacob to a place where he's alone. And he's alone with who? He's alone with the Lord. It says, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. It's good to be afraid sometimes. So you can start thinking about what's important. Somebody said, uh, oh, Ronald Reagan said this, reality may be a rough road, but escape from it is a precipice. It's better to stay on the rough road and work it out, if that's your reality. You know what Jacob starts thinking about in these important things? He starts realizing that in his own strength, he's weak. That angel just touches the hollow of his thigh and he will not be pushing stones off of wells anymore. God says, from now on, you'll do things in my strength, Jacob. Jacob realizes something else in verse 26. He said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou what? Except thou bless me. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jacob had the blessings. God's blessed Jacob's life, but God didn't bless Jacob. You can know you can come into a church and the Spirit can be good, and you say, man, we had a good church service today. The Spirit of God was there, and you can leave unchanged. 
Somebody made a joke about that. They said Jack Hiles preached so many life-changing messages. He used to say that at the beginning of a lot of his sermons. You're going to hear a life-changing message today. And one smart aleck in his school said, I heard so many life-changing messages, I don't know who I am anymore. (laughs) I hope you don't hear a life-changing message every Sunday. But every once in a while, one of them should stand out. Every once in a while, one of them should speak to you and you say, you know what, I am going the wrong way. I am going my own way. I can't just osmosisly absorb everybody else's spiritual condition and make my... I tried to do that in Bible school for a long time. Man, this is a spiritual place while things are happening, people are getting saved. And what are you doing, Isaac? Oh, just trying to keep my head above water, trying to figure out who I am, <laughs> trying to figure out where I'm at. God was blessing everything around me, but not his hand wasn't on me in the middle of Bible school. What's your name? Last time he heard that question, he said Esau. Who are you? I'm Esau. Not this time. Not this time. Verse 27, he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. I want to ask you today, what's your name? If I asked you in private, around the corner, nobody's around, what is your name? Would you say, my name is truthful? My name is honesty. My name is joyful. My name is gracious. My name is full of faith. My name is pitiful, courteous, gentle. All those New Testament words that are so unfamiliar to us sometimes. Or would you say, my name is selfish? My name is slothful in business. My name is sharp tongue, bitter spirit. My name is discontented. My name is desires of vain glory. Or would you have to agree with Jacob and say, my name is deceiver. You know what Jacob finds here? He finds out what's really important in life. What's really important? Verse 28, And he said, Thy name shall be called no longer Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou prevailed with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob, verse 29, asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Do you know what's important? It's not all about you. Jacob gets a spiritual curiosity here for a rare moment in his life, and he says, God, what's your name? God, can I learn something spiritual about you? And he calls the place Peniel because he's he's seen God face to face. Face to face. Peniel means God's face. Back there he said, the drought consumed me. And the Lord judge between me and thee. What is my sin? And give me my wages. And give me my wives. And now Jacob comes to the end of himself and says, God, what's it all about? What are you all about? What are you trying to do in my life? Number next, God says, let's put some toys away. Look at chapter 35. Chapter 35. Finish up here. Chapter 35, verse 1, God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, back to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And Jacob said unto his household and to all that are with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. He said, I thought they got rid of all those idols when they left. No, they didn't. Remember Rachel had some with her and she put them in the clothes basket hamper thing and sat on it and it's my time of the, I can't stand up and sorry dad and you can search the whole tent though and he looks and Laban doesn't find the idols and Jacob probably thinks they're gone too, I don't know. I imagine the story that uh, Jacob leaves for work one morning and says, hey babe, thanks for breakfast, see you, we're going, we're leaving. We'll be back tonight, gets about halfway down the driveway and remembers he forgot his cell phone or something, whatever it was. He turns around and goes back into the house and it's been kind of been 15 minutes and there's Rachel with all the idols all stacked up. You know, what do you do with idols? I don't know. Stack them up, make it, put rice in front of them like they do. I don't know what you do with idols. And she's got them all set out there and Jacob kicks open the door, kind of surprises everybody and sees this scene ahead of, what are you doing? And Rachel says, oh, this is what I do every morning. I just like to dress up my idols and make them all special and remember all the things of the past, you know, and all the things that these represent. These aren't, 
These are just aids to worship. And Jacob says, we don't do that around here. Get rid of that stuff. Jacob leaves for work again in a huff, grabs his phone, and off he goes. And Rachel never takes care of the idols. Because in chapter 35, Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. You know what you have to do in your home sometimes? You have to say, we know this is wrong, and we've already discussed that it's wrong, and we decided that this is not something we should be doing, but we're still doing it. It's time to get rid of it. Clean in house today. It's done. I don't know how you guys do that in your home, but it has to be done sometimes. There's just too much clutter, and Elijah's room just needs raked out. <laughs> There's just something that, more seriously, there's just something that the Lord's been dealing with you about and dealing with you about and dealing with you about. And you say, you know what? Those have to go. Jacob gets serious with the Lord here. And he says, let's put the toys away. And he goes back to where he left off. He goes back to Bethel. You know what going back to Bethel is? It's going back to the last place where you talk to God. And saying, God, I know I got a hold of you back there. I know you were speaking to me. I know you were real. I don't know if you have to drive to a place or if you just have to put yourself in your prayer closet again and say, this is the thing I need to go back to, Lord. Whatever it is for you. Sometimes God puts different things on different people. If I'm in a town where I used to live, I like to go to a couple places in that town. One of them is the place I got saved. I like to look in the back window of the church door and see this, the, the, the kitchen room where I got saved if it's all locked up. I like to go back to a certain tree I used to. They cut the tree down. But I like to go back to this tree across the street from a church where I used to pray. I like to go back to those places and say, Lord, <clears throat> I know that you were real to me right here and something happened. What does back to Bethel mean? It means you confess the unconfessed sin. I talk a lot about confessing your sin here because it brings cleansing. It brings clarity. You see that in verse 2. Be clean and change your garments. It reveals God's mercy. Every time you confess your sins, you have to have the attitude in your mind, God is forgiving me for this again. God sure is merciful. You know, in confessing your sins, you know what else it does? It justifies God and says, God, you are right and I agree with you. Confessing sins is more than just about you. Other people, when you confess your sins, other people see God as vindicated. You say, God, you were right all the time. I was the one that was wrong. And other people are warned and humbled. We see all this in the passages. They're saved. It causes you to take action. Rachel told him, or he found out about these idols. And he finally takes some action in his life. At this point in Jacob's life, his sons are a mess. People are dying in this chapter. Rachel's, Rebecca's nurse dies, and Rebecca later on. But in verse 5, God is still working. They journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Jacob's life was blessed, and he had a force field around him that nobody could touch him. You know what that's like in the Christian life? God says, Kurt, I want you to do this thing. And Kurt says, okay, Lord, we're going to do this new move thing. I'll, I'll run it, head it up best I can, Lord. And the Lord says, I wanted you to do that, and it's going to get done. You say, that's just a tiny little simple thing. God asks everybody in this room to do things from time to time. When you do those things, you're in the perfect will of God, whatever that is. You're there where God wants you, under God's hand. I do know what that is. And God says, ain't nobody going to touch you unless I say they can touch you. And you have the confidence, the absolute confidence to know that if something touches me, God allowed it and God's working in my life because I know I just talked to God this morning and I'm on the right track. That's a beautiful place to live. Jacob here, late in life, is just getting started. Like I said, it takes just as long to come back to the place as it took to leave that place, but he goes back to the place Bethel, and he calls it El Bethel, the God of the house of God. That's in verse 7. The God of the house of God. You know, God, what I thought before, that the building was important, the house of God, the place was special, but God, you know what I realized? It's you that's special when you're in that place. There's nothing spiritual about this place. There's nothing spiritual about any building in this town unless God is the God of that house. Are you going God's way this morning? You know what Jacob does in the end of his life? 
you would think, man, he did all these horrible things. His life must be a train wreck. He must be falling apart. No. No, he had, he had a, a son that kind of saved the day. He had one favorite son, Joseph, that went to Egypt, got ahead of the famine, protected everybody. His favorite son, the one that all of his children despised, they ended up all coming back together. All of them had to repent. All of the, Jacob ends up dying in Genesis chapter 49, surrounded by his whole family. Why? Because he started going God's way. You say, well, things get all torn apart and there's no hope and there's nothing left. I know, and that's what Jacob did. And Jacob ends up dying, giving a future prophecy to every one of his sons sitting in the same room with him. Getting along with each other. You say it's impossible. It could never happen. I know, and it happened. That's the story of the nation of Israel. That's the story of the Christian life. That's the story of me. That's the story of this church. That's the story of anything God's hand is involved with, is that God says it's impossible. You think it's impossible, and God says, that's where I like to show up, right there. Amen. Then nobody can get the credit but God. How else is he going to get glory? He shows up giving prophecies of the future and God speaking through him. He shows up at the end of his life giving blessings to the next generation and showing his fruitfulness that continues to this day. The fruitfulness of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. There's an entire nation today with their name on the map that the scholars said would never happen 200 years ago. Israel's prophecies were never accepted by the scholars, the major theologians of 150 to 200 years ago. And you have one Bible that's in print today by a guy named C.I. Schofield. He put notes in the Bible. He went against everybody's thoughts of the day in 1909, 1917, somewhere in there. He printed a Bible and he said, Israel will be restored. I like to keep a Bible in my office. It's got the old copyright. I think mine's 1910 or 17 or somewhere in there. And he says, he has the note in the passage, and he says, the nation of Israel has to be restored because of these prophecies. That didn't happen until 40 years later, 1948, the thing came to pass. That's fruitfulness. Of who? Of the least likely guy, Jacob, deceiver. Train wreck of a life. And brings it back together because he gets the God of the house of God. In the very last chapter of the book of Genesis, he's remembering the eternal. He's remembering the eternal. He says, don't leave my bones in Egypt. It's not all about down here, boys. Egypt is a picture of the world. And if we go into Egypt and we end up living there, take my bones out of Egypt because I want to give you guys a real good picture. There's some things that happen in this life that go beyond this life. One day we're going to be raptured out of here. And this life is not all that matters. What you do in this life in response to God is what matters for eternity. Amen. What was Jacob? Jacob just stayed faithful to the Lord. He just stayed faithful. Say, how hard is that? I don't know. Once you set your mind to it and you say, Lord, your things are important. It's not that difficult. Somebody said, I can only supply you with a canvas, a brush, an easel, and a palette of colors. I could give you a few lessons, but producing the masterpiece is up to you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with the Jacob example? Lord, I ask that you'd please bless the words that were spoken this morning. Lord, um, I want to thank you that uh, I have been like Jacob and that you were able to um, have grace and long-suffering with me and let me make it back to the place where I was supposed to be, get back on the right trail where you were leading the whole time. Lord, I ask that you'd help anybody in this room that, that understood any one point of those things about Jacob's life, Lord, that they would admit it, that they would agree with you, they confess any unconfessed sin, and that they would make the tough decision and help ask for your, for your grace to help them follow through and be faithful with that decision. Lord, I ask you please work in hearts here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We don't often have a time of invitation, but I want to just play through maybe one or two verses of a song. If you got to leave, feel free to take off. Try not to be disruptive to anybody else. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. We can have one or two verses of a song and then we'll close in a minute.
let's stand and be dismissed with something that we sang this morning. Just one verse of 357. 357. We'll just sing the second verse and then we'll be dismissed. This is talking about the life of Jacob. Number 357 on verse 2. Though like the Dismiss us and we're prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your life of love and your spirit. We won't try to do things in our own strength. You know, we just wait on you and, and everything we do, Lord. Thank you for today and just watch over and protect us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.